Everything is a test. And our text is the first scripture up there, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Paul, now remember, the church at Corinth was a big church. It obviously had a lot of gifts because Paul writes several chapters regarding the various gifts that this church manifested. So we would consider them a very spiritual church. Not a, although, you know, say, he does write about being carnally minded. So what people have picked up that they were just, and they, they were obviously to some extent, there were a number of people that were fleshly minded. They were always thinking about the world and the flesh and how to satisfy themselves. But they also manifested many gifts. So Paul's trying to, and, and in the first epistle, they had an issue in this church where one of the leaders, the elders of the church, had taken his father's wife to be his wife, not his mother, obviously. His mother had either passed away and the man had remarried. And Paul rebukes this church for letting this happen. Got it? Uh... And then in the second letter, he commends them for taking this by the this bull by the horns and solving this problem because he threatened to go there and take care of this issue. And basically Paul said, you don't want me to come here under these circumstances. He, he wanted to come back when things were right. Got it? So that just gives you a little overview of this church. So I think it's significant that at the end of his second letter, because chapter 13 is the end of this letter, he writes these words to this church. So it's applicable to every church, isn't it? It's applicable to every Christian. Young people, the same as old people. This, is, this applies to you. Here's what he says. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Now, you know, we do, as we'll see, we do all kinds of self-examination when you look in the mirror in the morning. <laughs> you you want to make sure that, you know, that uh, like Mark Dagnon, you don't have part of your lunch still in your mustache, right? And then somebody goes, ew, that guy's got his lunch in his mustache. I mean, Brit if Brittany were here. Brittany is a dental hygienist. And during her training, you know, they have a school here in Rockford. She was trained here in the, a dental hygiene school. I think it's associated maybe with Rock Valley College. I don't know. Yeah, they have a hygienist program. I think they do. Time. It's down uh, it's Je by Jefferson. It's by Jefferson Campus yeah, down on the south end of town. And so Mark, you know, you can go there free uh, and have your teeth cleaned. You don't have to pay because they, they're trying to, uh, you know, it's practical experience for these students to clean people's teeth. So Mark would go down there and Brittany met Mark. <laughs> I didn't know, he used to talk about this girl all the time, how wonderful she was and how much he liked her. I didn't realize it was Brittany, <laughs> before she was married, obviously. And she told, so we found this out at uh, Fran's funeral, we happened to sit at the same table with Brittany. <laughs> oh, then we were, you knew Mark Dagnon. Oh yeah, oh, I liked him so much. And I said, well, what about all the lunch in his, in his mustache? Oh, his breath was terrible. She said he had the worst breath. So. Uh, anyway, how did I get off on that? Oh, because we all test ourselves, we all examine ourselves, especially before we're going to go somewhere, to make sure that we don't, you know, look unsightly, right? Somebody goes, ah, like Phyllis Diller. I remember Phyllis Diller. You know, she had hair going in every which direction, and people were like, what are, you know, who are you? So, examine yourselves, or... Do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Question mark. So Paul is making a very important point here. Spiritually speaking, 
the criteria for being acceptable to God is that Jesus Christ is in you. How? By the Holy Spirit of God. He's a, per he's a man. He is physically sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father, so he can't you know, be in you as a man, but the Holy Spirit is called in the Bible the Spirit of Christ. So it's having the Spirit of God within us is just like having Jesus in our pre being in the presence of Jesus 24-7. Everybody got that? It's actually better. Because Jesus says it's to your advantage that I go away, which was shocking to the disciples, of course. Because if I don't go, the Father won't send Him. So this is very important for us. Now, all of us have faced tests. Right? Caleb goes, oh yeah, I get them all the time. Benny, you get tests? Yep. And of course, now that uh, Angela has graduated from high school, she's going to advance to the next level of her educational studies. And you probably will take some tests to see if you can skip some coursework, right? I hope you will. Because if they have certain tests that if you take them, you don't have to take beginners, you know, arithmetic or English. Or you can actually go to some of the higher classes based upon what you know. So we're all familiar with tests. And, of course, school is the most commonly understood and accepted. But marriage is a test. Isn't it? In many, many ways, marriage is a test. Not necessarily on purpose, but it is by its very nature a relationship based upon promises that two individuals, a man and a woman, make to one another. Isn't that right? You, you make a vow to love, honor, cherish, and, and various other vows that you make. And thus, since you make the vow, it has inherently in it a test. Are you going to keep those vows? Salvation, obviously, is a test, as our text so clearly uh, defines. Our job, the job we do, is really a test in many ways. And you know, I, I, I told John Coke this years ago when he went to Alaska the first time, <clears throat> to go because you know he's in, now he's a he'd worked in a bank before. Boy, what a difference between working in a bank and going up and working in the oil fields in Alaska. Big, big difference. But let me tell you something. The first, and the minute you you're new, if you go to a place and you knew that they're going to test you, they're going to find out what you're made out of. So I think one of the first jobs they gave John was to go to some connexes, which is a uh, container with no wheels on it. They put them on the ground to use them for storage. Well, that was one of the first things you had you do. And uh, and or go through that. People, what people would do, these roughneck, they'd open the door and they would throw stuff in and close the door. But even And you had to build some shelves, I think, didn't you? You had to do a number of things to try to organize, arrange, and make useful Literally, wasn't it stuff just piled in these things in some cases? Yeah, I mean, you could walk. There was a little walkway. Yeah, yeah a little walkway. Just, kind of like Lark's house. Here yeah. there, you know. Right, but the piles all over every place else. It, would, it wouldn't take the time to organize it. No, and so I told them, I said, the first thing you do when you go there is you let everybody know you're a Christian. That's the first thing you do. And make it clear. And secondly... It doesn't matter how menial the task. If they tell you to sweep up cigarette butts, you smile and say, I'll take care of that. And he did. And it wasn't long till one of the, one somebody, a superintendent or somebody, stood up and said, there's a guy here, I'm, I, mean, I know I'm embellishing it a little bit, but you'll allow me to do that. There's a guy here named John Coke. He's Jeremy Coke's brother. Yeah, I think he had you stand up, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, stand up. This guy came up here, and he's got those connexes looking like the Conrad Hilton lobby. Everything's all... 
And I've been here 20 years. I've never seen him this nice, and I expect him to be kept this. It, but what did he do? They put him. They gave him a test. They gave him a job nobody else wanted to do. You know. In fact, John said that some guys, if they'd ask him to do some menial tests, he'd say, "I ain't doing that. I didn't come up here to do that." And that's not the right attitude to have, because your job is a test. Amen? To find out how really, how good you are at what you do. Sitting down to eat is a test. Look on your paper there, Job 12, 11. Is that on there? I think maybe I, maybe I got it. Does not the ear test words as the palate tastes its food? Meaning, you know, you either say, oh, this is wonderful, or you keep your mouth shut, right, Mark? You never say one word. You don't say, this is terrible. When Josh, years ago, went to work for his Uncle Mike down on the farm, my sister was all about health foods, but she didn't like buying all these sugary cereals. And she didn't like buying name brands, so she'd buy these off-brand cereals. <laughs> one of them they bought, Jeremy said, it was just like eating styrofoam, Dad. I am not kidding you. Mike... Mike would say, just shut up and eat it. <laughs> Don't, you know, Linda would go get the cereal and he'd say, just shut up and eat it. Don't say anything. <laughs> so, uh, we all know how it goes when we eat. I see some of you nodding, <coughs> wives nodding your heads. Uh, Caleb only ate three bites of his hot dog yesterday. I, had to, I, had to, I did finish it off, Caleb, last night when I got home. Now, every time we look at ourselves in the mirror, we're testing some aspect of our appearance. When we look at others, we are practically testing their appearance and their lives, aren't we? I mean, somebody has actually a whole website called People of Walmart. And if you, you know, Gail's laughing. It's unbelievable what, you know, some people's appearance is that go into stores. And you're shocked. You think, no way, this can't be real. You mean this? Yeah. So we, we all know what this is all about, don't we? And uh, most tests we experience are not consciously recognized as such. We're not, we're not always thinking, you know, I'm being tested, I'm being tested, but we are in many, many ways. In a general sense, every waking hour is a test of some aspect of our lives. Our text clearly states that our entire lives are being tested for compliance to a standard, and that standard is Jesus Christ. Do you realize this, folks? On Judgment Day, now some have said we're going to be judged by the Ten Commandments, and that's not a wrong statement, but it's much more personal than that. Dean Harvey always told us Jesus Christ came to put a face on the law. One of the greatest expressions I ever heard in my whole life. So on Judgment Day, we are going to be judged by a person named Jesus Christ, a man. And he's still a man today. That's what Paul says in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 31, that we're going to be judged by a man. Read John chapter 5. That's exactly what Jesus says. He says, I have been given all judgment. The Father has given me all judgment because I am the Son of Man. Oh, isn't God fair? I love this about God, our Father. He's so fair. He says, I'm not going to judge you by a spirit being. I'm going to judge you by a human being, a man named Jesus Christ. So, that is the standard. That's the test for all of us. <clears throat> How does your life line up to the life of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about selling everything you have and going and sleeping on the ground and, you know, as Jesus went and ministered. I'm talking about his character, his motive of heart. Amen? Uh, remember, all the disciples were, were laborers. They, were, they had some kind of an occupation, weren't they? So Peter was a fisherman and several others were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. And others had various other occupations. So, uh, being like Jesus does not mean wearing sandals and a long robe and 
going around, you know, that's not what it means. It means being in character and in motive like our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God is looking for those who test positive for total commitment. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. So this heart test is the most important test, isn't it? God is going to test your heart. Now, it's obvious that we can see everything is a test. Now, from these tests, certain judgments or evaluations are made about the rightness or wrongness, goodness or badness, acceptance or rejection of what we know, our character, our discipline, and our moral destiny. It is the judging what the test means that is critical. Do you, do you understand this? A lot of people say, I'm okay. Well, com again, compared to what standard, right? So, judging the meaning of the test is very important. And that's what Paul says. Do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? So in this important test, it's the presence of Christ that makes you pass or fail. Right? Not how much you go to church, not whether you sing the choir, how much money you give to the church, how many tracts you pass out, how many Bibles you distribute. No, no, no. Is Christ living in you? That's the criteria that we have here. Now I intend to show, first, what is meant by test. Two, who tests us. Three, why we are tested. Four, how we are tested. <coughs> Five, when we are tested. Six, what constitutes pass or fail. Seven, if you fail, what you must do. And eight, if you pass, what you must do. Number one, what is meant by test? Now, there's a variety of meanings for the word test. First, Testing can be to verify qualities or characteristics by certain standards. We have the ASTM and the UL. Uh, if, you go, if you have any electrical appliance, you will find a UL approval label on it, even down to wiring and uh, sockets and switches. Why? Because we have capitalism so great, folks. God's so smart to give us capitalism in order to make certain that there aren't any corrupt people we have certain tests that are done to things that might cause fires or cause shock and so you you create you design a product you send it to a laboratory and they put it through a set of and they tell you what the tests are going to be they tell you how much stress is going to be put on it how many times they're going to do it before they'll put their sticker approved by United Laboratories all this testing has to be done on certain samples and then what they do is from time to time you have to submit production samples to them to make sure that you're still keeping you know there's all kinds of very stringent rules do you have to deal with that Billy UL or any of those things here yeah, yeah we've yeah. done that yeah so we got UL now you probably only buy UL approved motors and all your switches and everything else. But we have no idea how important, you know, we, we assume. When you walk into your house and you flip a light switch on, you don't wonder, is that thing going to electrocute me? Right? Because all this testing has been done to assure your safety. Right? Uh, and these are wonderful things uh, that we have these. Second, we also test to determine the limits of something. We have what's called destructive testing or fatigue test testing. By the way, all the parts on your car, <laughs> suspension parts, drive train <coughs> parts, things that are very important to driving an automobile, have to be fatigue tested or stress tested to make sure that the steel that they're using is not going to be too brittle and crack and break and not to be so soft that it's going to end up bending, right? It would be terrible to have that happen to you. 
And again, we get in the car, we turn the key, and we have no idea all that has gone on to provide a safe and comfortable vehicle for you to drive down the highway. But it's testing is very a big part of that. And uh, we had, a, at, at Warner Brake, uh, we had, a, where Harold and I worked together, Harold Alcorn and I worked together, we had a MET lab, a metallurgical lab. We had two metallurgists and every, the Harold worked in the Income and Quality Control Department, so when he would get a lot of steel, and he would have to send a sample up to that lab and they would, they would test it. They would do fatigue testing, they'd actually try to stretch it, how far, where did it break, because it, certain steels had to be a certain, certain qualities for them to machine and to make a product. So uh, this is a very, again, a very important part of even destructive testing. You know that car manufacturers run brand new cars into all kinds of uh, walls and objects to test the safety of the car. They destroy many cars a year. I don't know how many, but yeah, John. I belong to Consumer Reports, and um, they do all kinds of tests. And they're a private organization. Right. But they do thousands of tests, including cars and all these food, you name it, drinks, right. anything. In it. You know, for instance, like they tested chocolate, for instance. Hershey's chocolate had lead, the highest <laughs> black chocolate, or the dark, dark chocolate, yeah. rather. Had the, highest lead, dark, uh, lead. had the highest lead content of all the chocolates, wow. and they, they, they knew, and so Hershey has changed it. Okay, I mean he's yeah, got they, a lot of good. Right. So they, testing, the purpose of testing is to make changes, isn't that right? To fix the problem, not just to throw it out, to fix it. I had to throw one of my big chocolate Hershey bar away <laughs> because I found out after you read the consumer yeah. report. Well, okay. Well, <clears throat> it's true. That, that's a wonderful group of people that test all kinds of things, even past the manufacturer's testing. All right, number four, or number three. There's also a, a, a testing or an examining for truth by discipline. Uh, we don't do this anymore. Well, to some extent we do. If you're, if you're suspected of a crime, they might get you to the police station and you know, make it, they keep you up all night drinking. I think they passed laws not to stop a lot of that, but they used to. They'd keep you all night, up all night, and keep questioning you until you told the truth. So there is, and the Bible talks about that God scourges every son whom he receives. The Romans actually had, you remember Paul? Paul, they start a riot for Paul. And, and so they said, well, who are you? And he said, well, I'm just a, I'm just a Jewish guy. So they were, they were ready to stretch him out and flog him to get the truth out of him when he said, can you do this to a Roman citizen? And the guy goes, well, you're a Roman? I did, they thought he was, a I think he said an Egyptian or a Greek or somebody that had come in there. So there is that testing for the truth. Number four, to evaluate for knowledge by questioning, comparing, or contrasting. And that's a typical test in school that you might want to find out how much you, you've learned. Number five, we test to discover new methods or processes by experimentation. Those of you who've been in manufacturing know there's, a, there's an entire, when you have a problem, customer reports that the product failed prematurely and you want to find out is this one product or is this something inherent in our process they have a whole set of tests that you go through to find out where this failure is happening. Well, how, did this, how did this happen? I think I told you the story one time. Uh, Zenith Television, uh, who made television sets, called this uh, QC guy in to do a, he was an expert at quality control and manufacturing. And so he, they showed him on a plant tour. They went through the whole plant, showed him the whole place, and he got the, all their muckety mucks in a room together and the first thing a man said is when's the last time you shipped the TV without a tube in it? He said all the faces drained, all the blood drained out. He said how did you know? So apparently just a month or two before they'd actually shipped the television without no tube in the TV set. That'd be pretty hard to do wouldn't you think? So we to solve problems you have to test certain processes and systems. 
And of course, we test to analyze for trends, preferences, desires. For instance, KFC versus Popeye's chicken. They'll say, you know, we want you to test which do you like better. I mean, we remember the Coke, old Coke, new Coke, and Pepsi when they did that. Then we also have tests that simulate real life circumstances as preparation for the real event, like what happens on the first Tuesday of every month at 10 o'clock. A siren goes off. That's how, that's how I know it's the first Tuesday of every month. Because this we have a warning system, don't we, for storms. I think it was originally set up because of the nuclear power plant in Byron, that in case there would be a, one of the things that the Commonwealth Edison did to calm the fears of people after Chernobyl and you know what was there was a movie that they made a what was it called oh Three Mile Island they made a movie China the China Syndrome or some so people were fearful so they put this alarm system that would go off if something happened at the nuclear power plant now they use it for tornadoes and various other weather uh, things and then of course uh, on the radio, how many of you listen to the radio anymore? Do some of you, okay, some of you still listen to the radio. They have what's called the emergency broadcast. And every once in a while they'll go, beep. It's kind of unnerving. And they'll say, this was a test of the emergency broadcast. Had this been a real thing, then we, they would have given you information. And by the way, this started probably back in the 60s when the, remember the, Cuban Missile Crisis that came along, which shook everybody up, and you know, you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Jordan's going, I have no idea what you're talking about. These young people don't know. But during the presidency of uh, John Kennedy, the Russians put missiles in the, in Cuba that, that could be sent 90, 90, 90 miles, miles away from Florida. the United States, and of course that caused a big <clears throat> crisis, and we, we said, you either get them out of there or else. And that caused a lot of people to be very fearful of, you know. Of course, we have missiles in Poland and so on. Yeah. Right. We get by with it, but of course they can't. Of course, because we're the good guys. They're the bad guys. All right, where was I? Okay, turn my thing over. Now, our text this morning speaks of testing that which is moral rather than physical. We are being tested to see if we are serious and committed to live a holy life. That's, the, that's what God wants to know. And test is used three different ways in the scripture. One, man testing the patience or trying to find the limits of the grace of God. We'll see that later on. Two, God testing men to discover how they will respond to various circumstances. And three, our desires testing our self-control or self-denial. Temptation can be a test, can it? Well, essentially. <clears throat> now, who tests us? Well, first, we are tested by God. So, back to your sheet there, Genesis 22, 1 through 3. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So, I love this. You know, there's probably a, there's a lot going on between that verse and the next one. Right, Nicole? You're a mama. Yeah. And you know that I'm sure that Abraham had a conflict. I, it doesn't say whether he ever told Sarah or not. But if he didn't, you can bet that was his big concern. So, verse 3, Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split wood, and he split wood for the burnt offering. I love this. He's 90-some 90, 90 years old. 90, well, he's 101 by this time. He split wood. <laughs> Don't you love Abraham? What a guy. 90, 100, 100 years old, 101 years old. Maybe he's 110 by this time. He split wood. And uh, <clears throat> for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And then in Exodus 16, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven upon uh, for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. 
that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. <coughs> Exodus 20:20. 20, 20. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come to order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. Very important. God tests us to make sure we're not going to sin. Go ahead, John. Um, Abraham, you mentioned he's 100 years old. Isn't it? Didn't most people live hundreds of years back then? Right. He lived to be 180. Right. Isaac lived to be 170. So he wasn't unusual, uh, was he? Well, I mean, he, uh, he let's was put it this way. <laughs> the length of life, With, I'm saying. But, yeah, length of life. But <clears throat> remember, when Sarah heard God say, this time the next year you're going to have a son, she laughed. Why? Because she said, he's an old man. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm asking you, though, what, how old did people live back then? Well, 100, 130, 140. Oh, 100, I thought it was longer. Years. When was it that men lived in the 600 years? Seven, 800 years. Oh. Well, that was all before the flood. After the flood, Noah, of course, he was pre-flood. He lived to be 600 years old. Some of his sons lived to be 400 years old, but the, it got progressively less and less and less down through the generations. Yeah. Okay? So, they didn't have the pristine world that they had before the flood yeah. in terms of environment. Yeah. Uh, and they had to eat meat. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, God said uh, the commandments were given to test the people. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 2. All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. This is a very important verse in regard to testing us because God, we have a free will. So God has to test us to find out what we're going to do with our free will. Remember, that's really what God did in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? He said, you can eat anything you want, but you got one tree you can't. And Megan told Benny that night, that was to test Adam and Eve. That's why he put the tree. Benny asked, why did he put the tree there? To test Adam and Eve. Amen? And by the way, that's not a bad thing. We often think, well, how, why did he do that? Testing is good. That's not a, we should look at testing as a good thing, not as a, it's not punitive. Yeah, um, I don't think God individually tests us, and normally, I think it just, life itself tests us. Well, that's true, no doubt. But there may come times when he may, yeah. he certainly individually tested Abraham, no doubt. And he may test us individually. Why? Because he's not certain how we're going to react to a certain situation. For instance, it's normal for dads to love their sons. Abraham, you could bet he loved Isaac. God had to find out if Abraham loved God more or his son more. What did Jesus say when he was on earth? If you do not hate your mother, your father, your children, your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, yea, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. So, you remember Jesus, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but at the end of the sermon, Jesus tests Peter, remember, after he denied the Lord. What does he ask Peter? Do you love me? Three times he asks him, do you love me? So this is a big, this is a big deal. Yes? I think you know, we hear about Abraham and, and Peter and those, and I think that if God intends to use a person because he has plans for them to be an evangelist or whatever, yeah. he needs to know whether or not you're going to be able to handle the pressure, you're going to be able to be a good witness, and you don't just throw a, a needle fight out there. You've got to be tested before he gives you, I think, sometimes responsibilities. Amen. And that's what we do as parents. That's what of course. the industry does. We don't just send anybody out. So the fact that the world does test us all the time in a general sense, yes. But if you want to be used by God, expect that there's going to be some special tests yeah. for you because you need to be able to prove you're able. Amen. 
Very good point. And Abraham was going to be the father of a great nation. Yeah. Paul was, or Peter was going to be the leader in the church. So testimony <coughs> was important for those people. And of course, what did Jesus say at the Last Supper to Peter? Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. What does that mean? To test you. Amen? And Jesus said, I'm praying that you'll pass this test. Now, God wouldn't do it. Satan was asking. Of course, someone says, well, how's that? Well, remember the story of Job. That's exactly what happened with Job. And so, you make it sound like most pastors are tested. It seems like most pastors now are pretty, pretty poor. Yeah, but I think if... If God has, I mean, the Bible right. says God's looking over the whole universe on whom He, on whose behalf He can show Himself strong. He's always looking for good men, right? And good with women. good hearts. Yeah, with good yeah. hearts. Yeah, I'm sure. Not everybody who rises to that position right. has been tested or has passed the test, but God is Obviously. in the business of Obviously. looking for those people. I'm sure. I well, you've got to remember, not all pastors have good hearts, especially right. in our society today. Right. To become a pastor in our society, you go to seminary, you get a degree, you get part of these big churches, and they, they put you in a church. It doesn't, they don't call you in and say, now, do you really love God? Are you really committed? They want to know, do you have the credentials? That's what the, one of the problems with credentialing, yeah. Yeah. is that you get somewhere because you've got the degree, not because you've got the knowledge or the heart. Go ahead. You, you just send off to an uh, institute. Oh, that's right. Give you, one. That you can buy You can buy it. And then you can marry people. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. They do. Yeah. They don't that have was to a... have any training. Right. Yeah, some people do that, I know. But, uh, so God, there, man calls, certainly men call, and they do have, they do have some kind of a test. It means you got, you have a degree. In or you got the money. The other test is if you got the money, you can buy your degree. But there's a scripture verse that says, How will they believe in yes. whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? sent? So, you know, there are people who God does send out, but Amen. I think the test probably precedes that to make sure that they have the character. But like Absolutely. David's saying, not everybody does that. That's not the process. Right. Well, some, some preachers laugh and mock at the idea that God would ever call somebody. You understand? They don't even believe that, some of them don't believe, certainly not in the God of the Bible. They believe in a God like a, a thing, but not a personal, intimate God that you can really identify with. Remember, we are moral equals with God. Now, I didn't say we're intellectual equals. Or that we are powerful equals, but we are moral equals. That is, we have the same will, free will. We have the same conscience. God has a conscience because we got ours from Him. We have the same process of thinking. You got it? Because the Bible says, His thoughts are not our thoughts of sinners. Sinners. <coughs> but the righteous, the Bible says, we have the mind of Christ, doesn't it? Isn't that what the Bible says? So we... We're moral equals to God. How do we know that? Because we're called the children of God. And no matter what you say, your children might be younger than you, but they're your moral equal. You got it? They're, they're just an adult. They're a person just like you are. Younger, not as smart as you are, but they're still in your family. We're in the family of God. All right. Okay, <clears throat> let's just look at a couple more of these verses. Verse Judges, uh, chapter four, chapter 7, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Now remember the story of Gideon. He's, he's out threshing grain at night, I believe. Was he, I think he was doing it at night. Maybe not. He was out, I think it was at night. He was threshing grain. And an angel appears to him and says, oh, uh, you know, uh, hello there, man of God. He goes, what are you talking about, man of God? I'm the, I'm in the, I'm in the tribe, I'm in the, le I'm the smallest family and the sm least tribe in all of Israel. And God says, well, you know what, I'm going to use you to deliver, deliver you from the uh, uh, Midianites or whoever were oppressing them. I think it was the Midianites. He's, he, he's almost humorous. What are you talking about? You're going to use me? I'm a nobody. 
So then God says, well, send word out and call all of Israel together. You know, do you remember how many people were initially called? How many initially came? 32,000 came initially. So God says, that's too many. Because they're going to say, we did this by our own strength. So, get it. so tell them, those, everybody frightened their wife's pregnant, go home. So 10,000 of them went home. So I'll leave you 22,000. God says, still too many. So he says, I'm going to, this is what this verse says, there's too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. So God hears, again, he's exercising the test. Therefore it shall be that a he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So remember, it was the, whether you got down on all fours and lapped the water like a dog, or whether you picked it up in your hand and drank it. Was the, that was how God decided. And how many did he end up with? 300. Three, good, John. 300 men out of 32,000. How could I? Folks, I don't know about you, but Gideon had to have a lot of faith and just believe that God was going to win the battle with 300. But he tested God. Because yes. Remember, you know, the fleece is so, you know, he knew it was God telling him to do this. Right. There was no, I wonder if I wonder just if. some yeah. voice in my head. No, he knew God had promised. By the way, the great example of how patient God is with us, isn't it? That he tested God. And uh, yeah, what a story. Gideon, great man and a great organization. Amen. Thank you. And then, of course, in John chapter 6, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him. So Jesus even tested his disciples to test him for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Now remember, Philip was from that area. He was a local boy, so he knew where all the bread bakeries were, etc., etc. Now, so not only are we tested by God, but we are tested by ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 to 29. For as often as this is part of our communion uh, verses, scripture that we read. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine or test himself. In so doing, he is to eat the bread, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. In other words, if you don't test yourself and you just go ahead and take it, you could be eating and drinking judgment to yourself. Amen? And what is the purpose of communion? Well, it's Jesus says to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen? To remind ourselves in a very real sense of the death of and uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, then 2 Corinthians 13, 5, our text, test yourselves, he says. And then uh, we are also tested by our enemies. Daniel 1, 12. Remember Daniel. Here's what Daniel says. Please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. So Daniel proposes a test. And so the enemies... Daniel's enemies, who were the Chaldeans, remember, tested him to see if what he proposed to do was going to work. And it did, of course. They were fatter and healthier looking than their other men. And then uh, lastly, we are tested by Satan. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, of course, that's what Satan did to Job. Isn't that right? <laughs> he tested Job. And folks, he's one of the first guys. 
I want to look up and, and after Jesus. I want to find Job. What a man. After all the horrible things he went through, the Bible says he did not sin with his mouth, with his words. Nothing he said could be... He passed the test. And he's held up by God as one of the three righteous men. Ezekiel chapter 14 speaks of three righteous men. Job, Daniel, and Noah. He says, these three, are, they're, they're my guys. They're my righteous guys. Wow. So Satan can test us. Amen? And then, of course, he continues, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So next week we'll look at why we are tested. So if you can't remember your papers, leave them here. Okay? I mean, you probably have some extras, but if you, if you just stick them under the pew, if you want to take them home and read them, that's fine, but just don't forget them next <coughs> week when we come back we'll go through the rest of our scripture. Anybody have anything to say in closing this morning? I'd like to think that the 300 had more faith than the Yeah. Because you're going against a big group of people with 300 people, and you're going to take a little bit of fire in it. Yeah. A trumpet, a clay jar, <laughs> and a candle inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, but all of them had to have faith. Now, and by the way, you know, it's interesting that Gideon still wasn't sure. So what did God do? He said, you go over here, and you listen, and two of these soul, enemy yeah. soldiers, they're prophesying that it's nothing other than the sword of Gideon. There's <laughs> a I had a dream about a barley loaf falling into the fire or something. I can't remember exactly what the dream was. But, you know, they all had to trust in God. They all had to have faith that God was going to let them through. Now, remember, just in closing, this was not done in a vacuum. What's the historical precedent of 300, approximately 300 men? What would every Jewish child remember in their history. Come on, Bible scholars. No. Nope. Abraham, when Sodom and Gomorrah was ta attacked, and Lot with all his family was taken, how many servants did Abraham have? 318 servants. And he chased them down, split them into three groups, and, and the mother were five kings that attacked Sodom. You're not talking about some little army. This was a huge army. So the point is, Gideon would have known that story. So the number 300 was very similar to Abraham's little servants that he took out and defeated this vast, massive army and got everybody back, by the way. They all ran off. And, and we don't know the details, what they actually did. But I just think it's, they, so they weren't, point is, this, this idea wasn't in a vacuum. It was the fact that this had happened with Abraham. And remember, Abraham was the most important person in the life of every Jew. He, they all, we have Abraham as our father. And he, by the way, he was worthy of that honor, wasn't he? Abraham is a great man. He's called the friend of of God. And listen, folks, there's not many people who could say, I'm God's friend. So is it, I, I'm going to meet him too someday. Imagine meeting Abraham. There'll be sort of a hush when you're around men like this. Amen? Like you can't really say anything as you meet these great men of God. So, praise the Lord. Oh, Father, we're